Um, for those that uh, I haven't met, my name is David, uh, David Senior. I'm a priest and evangelist based at St. Paul's Howell Hill. Um, I serve on the presenter team at uh, Premier Christian Radio, and I give some of my time to the diocese uh, mission team doing things like vision days and evangelism conferences and evangelism networks and other things that are difficult to organize in the present uh, in the present circumstances but it's uh, it's great to uh, be with you today thank you so much for the gift of your time in terms of structure i'm going to be uh, chatting to michael we thought there've been so many webinars and so many kind of powerpoint presentations and whatever that we would be um, uh, we're going to do a, a uh, a conversation after which we're going to go into uh, uh, small groups and then come back um, into uh, a conversation. I say small groups, I think there are, just checking how many of, there are nine of us, so maybe we'll do two. Uh, yes, I have a, <laughs> a prompt from our director of communications there and uh, thanks to Wendy also for, uh, for masterminding today alongside uh, David Welsh from the Enabler team head of the enabler team. So uh, first of all, can I just, let's just commit this uh, in, in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for this time with, uh, with Michael and for his wonderful ministry of encouraging churches to reach out to those who are unchurched and those who have yet to, or have lapsed from their attendance of church. And Father, we, uh, we pray for, for your help today. Pray that we will be encouraged. Pray that we will leave today with tools and resources which enable us to grow our churches even in these difficult circumstances. And we remember all of those who can't be here today uh, due to other pressures and may they know your blessing and help. In Jesus name, amen. And so to, uh, uh, to Michael, I think most of you will have heard of uh, Michael Harvey, who has made a specialism of uh, helping us to invite others to church and invite others into faith. Um, he is a, an author, author of uh, Unlocking the Growth. And um, he didn't ask me to do this, but I thought I would just wave this uh, excellent tome <laughs> on uh, creating a culture of invitation in your church. He also does um, really excellent seminars for us uh, as a mission team in the diocese. Uh, we've canceled quite a lot of really good seminars recently, including a couple that, uh, uh, that Michael was due to uh, present, I think in May uh, of this year, but they've been really valued by those who come. Uh, he also uh, initiated the uh, Back to Church Sunday, the weekend of invitation, um, and has created a brilliant uh, uh, God and Science offering, which uh, is for school pupils to understand that there is no conflict. So a real uh, innovator for Christ. And it's great to uh, have you with us, Michael. Um, let's start before we home in on lockdown and viruses and all the rest of it let's start with your work on invitation which you know has been very broad based in many ways it's really obvious to us that we need to invite more people into our church communities uh, many of our churches including our own we have people who've been who've grown up in faith or who have transferred having grown up somewhere else we don't see enough new Christians and our, our church members very often don't reach out in the way in which we would, we would like. So what, have you, what are the kind of insights and methodologies that you've brought to this? Well, David, thank you. Thank you for the question. And um, I've been uh, researching uh, invitation now for about 16 years and um, and it's, and it's been really, really fascinating. Um, I'm a Anglican lay person uh, myself. And, um, and I, I started trotting around the world about 16 years ago uh, because of Back to Church Sunday. And I turned myself into what I would call a stupid question asker. Um, so I would kind of go to um, congregations around the world and ask them stupid questions. Um, and um, 
And one of the first, you know, stupid questions uh, that I asked um, was, um, I, I'd get in front of a normal congregation. Mind you, can there ever be a normal congregation? But anyway, let's just leave that to one side. Anyway, I get in front of a normal congregation and I would, I would ask uh, them in silence to ask God, is there someone God is nudging them uh, to invite? Um, and I'd leave a little bit of silence. And, and what I discovered by asking that question was that 70% of congregational members already have the name of somebody that God was nudging them to invite. I mean, seven out of 10, I can almost assure you folks that in your congregations right now, seven out of 10 have got the name of somebody uh, that God um, uh, is nudging them to invite. So I'm calling that the church's greatest missed opportunity, the greatest missed opportunity. Um, it's the greatest because this is not us thinking this up. You know, this is, this is truly God nudging uh, people to invite. Um, and it's missed because very often we don't start with God we, we often start with an event rather than God. You know, we'll say things like, oh, we've got harvest coming up. This will be a really great time to invite somebody. Or Christmas, you know, uh, Christmas is coming up. It's a really great time to invite. And what happens is it's not the individual that's inviting somebody. It's harvest that's doing it. It's Christmas that's doing it. And then we wonder the week afterwards why the person hasn't come back again. Well, because it's the event doing it. So that's the first stupid question that I started asking as I trotted around the world. The second uh, stupid question I would ask is, well, if seven out of 10 of us have got the name of somebody that God is nudging us to invite, what on earth is going on? Now, it, you know, it was, it, it's more kind of specific than that, my, my question, but for, for our sake, what on earth is going on? And what I discovered, folks, was that 80 to 95% of Christians, this is right across Western Christianity, 80 to 95% of Christians have no intention of inviting anyone. Um, and when I discovered that, I thought, well, that's, that's, that's over for me. I, I, you know, after all of the, the years of working and researching and trying to understand, you know, why Christians don't invite. And then I discover the vast majority of us have got no intention of doing this. Little did, I discover, little did I know that I was going to discover that actually that was the key piece of information that I needed. Because when you think about it, who do we know in our Bible stories um, who wanted to answer the call of God? You know, which, which of them? Like there was none of them really, was there? There was none of them. Most of them, when God called them to do something, hesitated you know some went but reluctantly or some ran in the opposite direction and you see this has led me to the following insight to become a church that invites to become a person that invites as prompted by god we don't need confidence which is, I, I think, what some of my missional, national missional colleagues might, might suggest. What I think we need is courage. And we don't talk enough about courage because the reason 80 to 95% of us don't want to do this is that we're scared. You know, we're scared of, you know, what somebody might say. We're scared that somebody might ask us a difficult question that we don't know the answer to. You know, we're scared of getting a knockback in some way. So, you know, if I was to kind of, you know, suggest to you, 
where the real problem is as to why we don't invite is because I don't think we emphasize enough courage to do it. Courage mm. to do it, David. Yes, we will be uh, coming along c- coming along in a moment to uh, one particular methodology uh, which you're suggesting for building connections. In general terms, I know those of us who are involved in church leadership get, you know, we think of the early church and the risks that the early Christians took to make uh, Jesus known. Uh, how do we change the culture? so as to embolden people, so as to you know, reassure them that the provenient role of the spirit is drawing people that want, to, not everyone, but drawing a significant proportion of people who may be interested in engaging with faith and engaging with church activities. How do we give them that courage? How do you drive that cultural change? Well, um, it's a good question, David. I, I think, um, um, we will come to the methodology later on mm-hmm. that I'm suggesting as a way to kind yes, of get specific. us all into this. Yes. But I think, yeah, but I think there's a leadership issue that we've got at the moment that we've got to get the right messaging uh, out there. Um, and I know Wendy is the head of communication. So me- messaging we know is really, really important, really important. So, Here's three messages that we need to kind of get across to become um, a church that invites. First of all, success is just the invitation. Leave the result to God. That's a really key message. Success is just the invitation. Leave the result to God. See, if we think about that from a, from a biblical point of view, that would be, I, Paul, planted, Apollos watered, but it's God that gives the increase. Unfortunately, in our generation, we tend to concentrate on the increase, but we don't concentrate on the planting and the nurturing of relationships and in making planting invitations so success is just the invitation leave the results of god the second leadership thing that we've got to do is to recognize that we need to be as interested in the inviter as well as the person being invited so we've got to be interested in what is happening to us as well as what happens to the person that God sends us to in this process. At the moment, it looks to me as if we've got the cart before the horse. We seem to be only really interested in the person that we haven't got, rather than being interested in the person that we have got. We've got to bring the two things together. So God's doing something in us as well as through us in this process Um, and then the third uh, thing is a bit of a shocker so I'm glad you're all sat down in your homes Um, unfortunately John Zamblin's out so everybody remain calm with this third this third thought it's a bit of a shocker folks Um, so here's the third thought that that God is leading mission God is leading mission the mission is God's It's a shocker, isn't it, eh? Oh, and we thought we were leading mission. Oh, my goodness. You know, that God's leading mission. My goodness. You know, unbelievable, really. You know, that God could be involved somewhere. Well, the reason I would say that is, you know, doesn't doesn't even Jesus say, I need to be about my father's business. I need to be about my father's business. Folks, it must start with God. It must start with God. It it can't be just us, David. Indeed. Yes, as they say, the God of mission has a church in the world, and that's our role. And uh, your insight that the provenient role of the Spirit is prompting people, what I think Nick Harding refers to as the people of peace, who, who lean in and will respond and indeed one in six I think the hope research said one in six of all those that we know would accept an invitation to church if that was made 
So uh, thank you for um, that. And I know that your seminars and uh, resources are doing a lot to help churches to, um, to, fit, to enable that, to, to challenge their congregations to start doing this. And, and when, we, when we try, we get a good result, don't we? Because particularly around here, um, there is still great respect uh, for the church and we get a much warmer response than we, than we often fear. Moving into the specifics of lockdown, you suggested that we talk through the, uh, uh, what you've observed about the current situation. First of all, in, um, in the first weeks, uh, lockdown one, <laughs> sounds like a film, doesn't it? In lockdown one, uh, what did you observe? What's your take on what we were all being told about the huge numbers, watching live services and all the rest of it? Um. Yes, uh, I guess it's lockdown two now, isn't it? This is the sequel we're going into now, kind of, uh, we're going to experience. Um, yeah, I personally had a really horrible uh, first 72 hours of the first lockdown, um, when everything was cancelled or postponed. But really interestingly, kind of over this period of time, um, I've never spoken to as many people as I have in 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 the first lockdown, you know, kind of, webinars and Zooms and everything has really increased, you know, the possibility of, of being able to kind of get uh, to people. Um, and, you know, we, and, you know, there's been some amazing, you know, work, you know, online, um, you know, just because our buildings, you know, have been closed, doesn't mean to say that the church has disappeared. In fact, you know, I think the church has been even more active um, than, than previously because, uh, I don't know if it's like the same with you, but, you know, I've received phone calls from other congregational members that I would never have ever received uh, because uh, pastoral care, you know, uh, became more in focus, you know, during uh, during lockdown one. Um, and, and I think um, um, I, I think uh, that 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 we have still had a, a real opportunity of of being church in our communities. Um, you know, we we were locked out of our buildings. Almost, uh, God uh, kicked us out into our neighbourhoods, into our communities, and we and we and we suddenly, you know, suddenly kind of um, uh, discovered that actually, you know, we could be church. You know, where God had placed us, David. Mm. And. Um... As we move towards uh, this new situation and we move towards winter and an intensification of the social needs and the economic needs and the weariness and the fractiousness and division which seem to be characterizing the current time, what are you feeling about the present situation, both the call on the church and the opportunity for evangelism and, and, and service? Yeah. Um, never has there been a more important time for Christians to connect uh, with those around them never ever ever in our generation you know after kind of now weeks of um, of people being in lockdown people shielding um, weeks of isolation of disappointment you know of anxiety after weeks and weeks of this um, I believe that people have got big questions um, uh, anecdotally and from all the information I'm getting from Christians that are working in working with me across the UK um, um, people are more open to having deeper conversations than they were before not everybody not everybody but many people uh, are um, and 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 it's never been more important for for Christians to be in connection with those uh, big questions. Um, I think people have moved from a feeling of invulnerability uh, to, a, uh, to a feeling of vulnerability. Um, you know, they've realized that, um, um, that they're not in control. And I think we've all gone through this global near death experience, mm. you know, which has shaken many, many people uh, up. Um, and so um, I think now's the time you know, to really um, connect, you know, with our neighbours, with our friends, with our, um, with our work colleagues, you know, um, because God is at work. I mean, whisper it, folks. Um, mm. God, God has not been 
uh, on furlough. It's a shocker, isn't it? God yes. didn't get the message. It's, it, it's a real shock. I know, I know everybody's kind of shocked at that. But mm. it looks as if God has been at work, you know, in and out of homes, you know, across uh, this nation. Mm. And, and I think, um, you know, we've got another chance now as we go into lockdown again for three or four weeks is how can we be church when we when we're not in our buildings well what a wonderful opportunity you know to look outward um um uh, you know in these next in these next next period of time david indeed and uh, and um, it's amazing how people connect through this technology there's something about the security of home and the capacity to leave a meeting at will that seems to make people own up uh, open up and uh, and enter into relationship now you've developed a particular methodology, an acronym, which I'm going to leave you to announce, uh, to help us be more intentional about, uh, each of us, to be more intentional about establishing a relationship or relationships. Could you take us through that, uh, Michael, and then we will um, break into groups and, uh, and reflect on its applicability to our contexts. Yes, the, 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 the methodology I call ACORN, ACORN, and each of the letters of the word ACORN is part of the, uh, of the process. I, I, I want to call it a way of life. Um, I've been looking for something to help ordinary uh, congregational members to actually kind of um, um, to, 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 to pause and uh, to look around them in their communities and in their neighborhoods. Um, um, to kind of borrow Rishi Sunak's um, uh, phraseology where he said, eat out to help out. This would be our reach out to help out uh, scheme. Um, and so called ACOM. So I'll take you through each of these letters slowly but surely and I'll um, try to explain how it's working across the UK. Um, so the A of the ACORN is ask. And so I'm trying to get 100,000 Christians around the UK to uh, uh, ask each day, um, uh, or pray each day, uh, a simple prayer, which goes like this. Lord, today, is there someone you want me to connect with outside of the church family so again that 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 prayer this this ask it's lord today is there someone you want me to connect with outside of the church family so again based on the idea you know of jesus saying i need to be about my father's business um, um, um and so we start with god um and then the second part of ACON is the C, which is the call, which is the call. Now, when we pray that prayer, God will call us. Now, it might not necessarily be that um, um, as you pray the prayer, that writing will appear on the wall. I can't promise that, folks. I, I do apologize. Um, but as you're around the M25, you might not appreciate uh, writing on your wall. So that's probably a good thing. Right, right, uh, but you know what? You know, sometimes, yeah, sometimes you get a sense, don't you? You just get a, get a sense, you know, you know, somebody, somebody jumps out at you, you know, as you're scrolling you through your phone or you, you, you look at your address book um, or you're on your daily walk, you know, and somebody comes walking towards you. And you think to yourself, oh, no, oh, no, not that person. You know, give me another. Well, somewhere along the line, somewhere along the line, God will call us. OK, so let's just assume God's called us. Then we move to the, the, the third um, bit of this, which is the obey bit, the obey bit. So O is for obey. So ask, call, obey. So what do we do in the obey bit? Um, well, um, here's, here's a radical idea for you. Um, you pick up the phone. Do you remember when you used to use phones? Oh, yeah, yeah, no, we still do, do don't we? Right, you pick up your phone and, um, or you pick up your Zoom technology 
and you simply dial the person. So radical that, isn't it? Radical, you know, dial the person that God has brought to mind. It's a shock that, isn't it? And you simply say to them when they answer the phone or the, or the Zoom, you simply say to them these words, this is the key part of the training for today. Uh, this is quite complicated. You probably need to write this down, you know, kind of, it's very complicated. Here they are, here's the, here's the words. How are you? Yes, no, I do apologize. I, I, you know, I know there's nothing intellectual about that. Um, but you see, the thing is, right, if, if God can get away with where are you, you know, in Genesis, then surely we can get away with how are you? Um, now, the reason, the reason I say that is because um, there's this missiologist, the studier of mission, Vincent Donovan, who wrote a book called Christianity Rediscovered. And he said, we make the mistake as Christians of thinking we're taking God with us into any given situation. Big mistake. God is already there. Our job is to find out what God is doing and join God in that conversation. So um, by asking the question, how are you? We're trying to join the conversation. Now, the truth of the matter is, when you ask the question, how are you? Everybody in the UK knows what the answer to that question is. Everybody knows the answer to that question. It's fine, isn't it? It's mm. fine. You know, your left leg might be dropping off, you know, but you're fine, you know, apparently. So you're going to have to reset the question. Really, how are you? which then gives permission for, for people to tell us how they are. And we will find God in their anxiety, in their worry, in their pain, in their hurt, in their ache. We'll find God there. That's where we'll find God. And we just join that conversation. And um, so that's the obey phase. And it might go a little bit further. You know, it might go a bit further, but... It's just basically, how are you? Um, and, you know, it's, it's like, you know, Christ in you, the hope of glory. You know, we're peace bringers in a given, you know, situation. So that's the O, that's the O. Uh, the fourth uh, part is the R, which is report, which is, which is report. So everybody in the Diocese of Guildford knows what a report is boy do you know what reports are my goodness so you, you were on to a winner here there's no training needed here my goodness you're experts at reports anyway no but this these this is this is a report and and what one of my recommendations is or one of the things i'm going to suggest to you i would love to set up an acorn group um in the diocese of guildford uh, with with a church or with um with anybody on this um, that's listening to this webinar um, um, so that on three consecutive weeks we can report to one another of what happened when we prayed a prayer lord today is there someone you're nudging us to connect with outside of the church family so we report to another group of christians the old-fashioned word for report of course is testimony it just doesn't spell acorn, so it's, it's, it's pretty bad, really, isn't it? So it has to be reports, but I have confidence you'll be great at reports. Um, 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 and then the final uh, bit um, of, of this process is the N, which is the N, which is, uh, which is notice. We're going to try and notice God. So when we meet together as a, re as a, as a, as a group, we will notice God in the report. Because we'll ask, ask one another, what is God doing in us and what is God doing through us as we report? And we're going to get a few people in a kind of a group, you know, kind of really reflecting on what they've heard from somebody else. Uh, these ACON groups um, are set up now around the country uh, in, from uh, Inverness, which I think is the furthest north one, to down to the, uh, to the, south, to the south coast and anywhere in between groups of Christians that are meeting together to actually 
a practice, a way of life in mission. We need, honestly, folks, we need a way of life for mission, a way of life, because, you know, kind of um, we've misunderstood um, that when God calls us, um, that there will be that will, there will be fear and it's going to be OK. But we need one another to encourage one another in these in these ways uh, of meeting God's call. David, can I also say for those watching the record um, that Michael has very off you know, within reasonable constraint, if we get dozens, that would be different. But uh, uh, very off kindly offered to work with individual uh, parishes uh, to do three of these evenings, encouraging people and helping them to make uh, to intentional relationships. He can be contacted, and I've GDPR permission to share this, uh, contacted at uh, Michael at weekendofinvitation.com, weekendofinvitation.com. So any... Um, if not wild enthusiasm immediately to set up a group, any any reactions? What did you think of this in your groups? Go for it. Yes, Jane, do come in. I think that many churches are already starting to do this. My experience of the diocese is that there are quite a lot of groups who are not necessarily following exactly what you're suggesting, but who are doing very similar things. Partly, I think, linked to home groups or small groups of various kinds where people are quite deliberately looking to invite others um, and following that system I think it's really good and I think people might really enjoy it but I do think you'll find that there's quite a lot of it happening in similar ways in the diocese. Jane thank you and do you see things like that happening in your context I think you said it was Leatherhead where you're yeah, I'm in Ashstead, yes, Ashted, St George and St Giles in Ashstead. Yeah. Yes, we have a very strong parish team um, yeah. of clergy and laity, and we do quite a lot of this kind of work. We're, we're quite intentional in our yeah. methods. I mean, going back to the days where we, we went round the streets delivering videos, Jesus videos, knocked Indeed. on every door in the village, you know, that kind of thing. Yes, yeah, so there's so, a very strong evangelistic tradition at your church, certainly. There yeah. is, yes. So Any I think I, like thought I saw Peter preparing to come in at some point. Uh, uh. Yeah, I mean, in in terms of of my my old um, parish, as it were, um, so definitely uh, I think work on on in two dimensions that sort of um, uses some of this methodology. I think um, there's a quasi sort of pastoral group in St Martin's, which is very much actually the keeping in touch type group um, with a little bit more in terms of how can we help on various things. And then in Pixham, which is the daughter church, um, there has been something which is probably a bit more intentional outreach um, because Pixham is a smaller community. The church is sort of right physically in the center. It's, it's not quite the same as the sort of town center church that, that St. Martin's is. So I think there is some, some related um, um, sort of activity that I just need to sort of think through how, how does ACORN actually sort of relate to, to that. Um, we actually, in, in our group, just very quickly, spent quite a lot of time talking about the anonymous people who are watching online offerings and how do we connect to them? Um, and Jane was uh, there was talk about um, inviting people to Zoom coffees at the end of online worship and things like that. So there, there are techniques I'm sure that one can apply. Um, but certainly I think that is a very interesting because you, David, referred to the sort of comfort factor of anonymity, but that's the frustrating thing in a way that we don't know who those people are. Uh, thank you, Peter. A great question. Michael, can I bring you in on that? Uh, what you make of whether there is a huge online audience waiting to go deeper in relationship here? Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, there is a there is a huge audience, you know, whether it be online or offline. But if we just take the online uh, audience, um, I think um, the idea of of offering, you know, kind of Zoom coffee afterwards is just a perfect, you know, it's a, just a perfect way you know, of, um, um, of connecting with people that we don't know. And, um, and you know, people are, are just waiting to be invited. You know, not everybody's gonna say yes, of course, 
but actually to offer an invitation to go and grab a coffee and and um, and 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 we'll we'll be back for a um, a Zoom conversation afterwards is a, is a really great way for every church to try and kind of um, encourage those who are listening, definitely. And highly engaging services where we've got uh, a number of different contributors. People are of short attention spans, haven't they? They're used to having lots of different people and things coming in, chat feedback on the sermon ways of making people feel that you can get involved this isn't a kind of didactic church where one person talks at you all the time so really helpful michael thank you any other questions or observations that came out of your groups yes Anne, you're you're muted at the moment i think yes in in our group we felt that the, um one of the biggest obstacles was um other people's perceptions of us as church people and um and, the, and they just sort of re really sort of um, brushed us off and uh, and, uh, uh, and and we felt we couldn't go further. That's an interesting one, isn't it? I mean, Michael, yes. do you think that when we engage with people outside and say, how are you, you were on my mind, do you think a barrier comes down saying, oh, you know, Anne's a church person, you need to be careful here? Perhaps we're imagining that barrier. What do you think, Michael? Um, yeah, and there's, there's no doubt about it, you know, that um, some people don't want to engage in these, in these um, subjects. Abs absolutely, you know, e even Jesus had people who, who basically kind of turned in the opposite direction. So we, we've got to learn, you know, that that is, you know, always going to be a possibility. Um, um, but I think also, you know, as David, you've intimated, we do sometimes just make decisions, you know, on behalf of other people, um, you know, oh, they're not going to be interested because, you know, of this or this, you know, so we're so Christian about invitation. We do the thinking for our friends, you know, will my friend, you know, kind of want to come to this, um, no, you know, so we save them the bother, you know, of saying, you know, no to a question, you know, we don't want to ask them, you know, so, so yes, yeah, sometimes we will be, you know, kind of uh, rejected in some way, but other times, actually, it's just in our imagination and, um, and that's life, you know, that's life, that's, that's, that's the way, way it seems, seems to work, David. Mm, and indeed the, uh, uh, as, as you were saying earlier, Michael, the success, Anne, is not, um, is not so much that person saying, wow, I immediately give my life to Christ, can I tithe to your church? But uh, it's, it, the, 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 the success is actually you saying, uh, how are you? And we, do you want to come along to something or engage with this or watch that online or, uh, or, uh, or whatever? The, the saying of Dr. Johnson, the greater part of confidence is having done the thing before comes to mind. And I think once we get people to do this, hopefully it's going to, it's going to roll. Can I make one yes, question? Sorry, Anne, go on, you, you go ahead. Well, I think you can't deny the fact, I think that the culture of the church doesn't always, re um, is appealing to people on the outside. So whilst we may have the message, the way we conduct ourselves in, in within the service, the, the way the priest dress, the language we use is, it, it, that can be a big turn off for people. I'm a street pastor and I, I meet young people who are very interested in the message, but I, I am prejudging, but with some knowledge, they would find it very difficult to enter into some churches because of the culture of the church. And the people that find it easier to go to church are things like HTB, where there's, you know, it's the music and things. So they're not so keen on coming where you hear the organ and people are dressed up and people have got their seats. So um, I that's, think, yes, that's uh, great, great point. Can I um, uh, bring Michael in at that point, just to say, uh, I think Anne raises this very good point that uh, obviously we, we can't change the tradition and culture of every church instantly, but what are some of the things that we can do to make our services more accessible and less daunting. It, and it's a really, really good point. It's the number two reason that Christians in Western Christianity don't invite, 
because we've got really nothing to invite them to. It's the number two reason. It's not the number one reason, but it's certainly the number two reason. The number one reason basically far outweighs the number two reason. Um, um, and I think we've concentrated very much on the number two reason um, so that we try and make our services uh, strictly come dancing perfect. You know, so everything is just, you know, kind of, you know, organized spontaneity. Everything is organized within an inch of its life. Um, but yet, even when that happens, you know, still Christians don't invite. Still, honestly, honestly, you, you, you'd think, you know, once you kind of got these kind of services, which were, you know, um, timed, you know, 59 minute, 53 second, I call them services. Um, even when even when that happens, uh, still, still, they don't invite. Um, and so there's something else kind of going on. Here's another way of looking at it. One, one way of looking at it. We have to reimagine what church is. We have to reimagine church. We've fallen into the trap of thinking church is the act of worship on a Sunday morning. It's, it's a big trap that. Um, and so we so much effort goes on into the 10.30 while 12.30 bit. But when God nudges us to invite somebody, we are church to them. We mm -hmm. are church, you know, where two are gathered in my name. I'm there in the midst. So the first, you know, kind of um, part of church that they meet is us. So Christ in you, the hope of glory. Um, I've been working with a church um, um, who's got several ACORN groups um, who haven't met physically um, uh, for weeks and weeks and weeks. But what that church would say is that they have grown in numbers because uh, people have connected on a one on one basis. Um, and so I would just really kind of remind us all that church is where two or three are gathered in my name. Now, that, that doesn't mean to say, you know, that we don't look at our acts of worship and how we can um, 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 give worship to God in a better and better way. But the first thing is we are church individually. We become chaplains to individuals. And that's what Street Pastors does beautifully absolutely beautifully so and thank you uh, for that thought indeed and thank so you, for you that wonderful... so when you say back to church you don't mean back to a building then yeah you see, uh, this uh, you see, I, um, that's <laughs> this is one of the kind of the difficulties that i get myself into you know kind of um everybody assumes you know kind of uh, what back to church means you know and and so over the 16 years of researching this you know, kind of God is sending his people to meet people where they are. You know, that's the first part of church. Now, you know, we we forget that part. And so, and so, yeah, I mean, if you look at what I've said with the ACON process, it's one person contacting one person. That must be the beginning part. It must be. Um, and then eventually there may well be an invitation into an act of worship. But the first part is crucial crucial yes and people people need to overcome the hurdle of the first time you invite my experience is the first time you're quaking like a jelly is all very difficult i'm not sure if i can do this once you've done it two or three times and invited someone or spoken with something about the things of god suddenly you realize it's okay because actually I'm going where God already is, like you said at the beginning, Michael. God is already there and I'm just joining the conversation. And then people will come and it's so exciting when one person comes because you invite them that it's really worth doing. Jane, yeah. you should be a business partner of Michael because I think that's a wonderful encouragement to a culture of invitation. That was a wonderful uh, endorsement. And uh, just having gone uh, three o'clock, I think, unless there are any other pressing um, uh, questions, um, I'm going to move in a second to, oh yes, Linda, do come in and do unmute. Linda, you need to unmute your microphone, I'm afraid. Yeah, just, just one question. I mean, looking at the audience today, we're all of a sort of certain age and everything. And a lot of the people that we're likely to invite are also going to be a certain age. Um, 
we as a church really would like to invite more of the young families to mm. engage. Um, have, have you got any tips for that, Michael? Uh, great question. And as you kind of could see with the ACON process, what I'm particularly interested in is asking God, is there someone that God is nudging us to invite? And, um, and what I've found is that um, um, sometimes when that happens, um, younger, younger people um, or younger, younger uh, people with families, you know, come to mind. Um, and it's often, the, you know, a connection from a, um, an older person that will make, you know, kind of a big difference there. Um, so again, uh, it, it, Christianity really has always been about one person inviting one person. And so, so all I would, all I would go back and suggest is, you know, uh, is ask God, you know, is there a young person? Is there a young, you know, kind of a, a, a young mum or a, um, a young dad, you know, kind of, you know, with, with a family that you want me to invite? Why not switch, switch the prayer around and be even more specific? Lord, give me, you know, somebody, you know, of that, of that age. Um, and then all I would say again is the first connection is with us. You know, then one takes it from, from there as to kind of what happens from that moment on. So that's the best advice I can give. Um, um, because again, if we change everything within our churches, what I've discovered is still there's a problem inviting. So if we sort the inviting piece out, the other piece will come later. Michael, thank you. Peter? I, just very quickly, because it, it, it trained a thought, something that came from Pixum, and I think it was Dave Cowan who told me about this. Um, th this. The intergenerational dimension is a very useful tool, and it's not just the mother and toddler. Increasingly, there's interest in granny and young school kid, because they're on the pickup duty, mm -hmm. um, and they often have time at the end of the afternoon which is actually quite tricky for them to fill uh with with, with grandchild um and there are ways that you can actually get into into the, one of those generations but you actually you know the, the the way in may be any one of those three levels indeed and yeah. um you know our encouragement i think to any parish looking to develop its ministry would be to talk to uh well to the parish coordination team and then uh, through that to uh, Emma Coy as our specialist advisor here because <clears throat> even with the modest resource base there are many ways in which we can grow from toddler groups and other after school and other ministries start to grow relationships and then do something special for the family an informal tea or something four o'clock it being a very good time to get people together um, and it doesn't have to be massively elaborate and it doesn't have, they don't all have to be trooping into church at 10 o'clock for it to be church. And we're seeing many different forms of church growing. At that point, um, I am going to, uh, uh, to thank Michael and also to, uh, I think, to commend um, ACORN. We would love to, uh, to see this model um, pioneered within the diocese. I think to, uh, to take, I think it was Jane's uh, uh, point, uh, we certainly don't want to replicate uh, um, existing initiatives, but the key thing about this is it feeds into them as I understand it, because we have lots of different invitational events. We have, well, <laughs> when we're allowed to have events, we have process evangelism courses like Alpha and Christianity Explored and other things online. We have lots of, and we've got services, of course, lots of things to invite people to lots of initiatives. But certainly in my experience as a minister, when we say we're doing something special, invite your friends, you tend to get a, a, a limited response because the relationships aren't there. And what ACORN is about, something which I hope existing groups can buy into, is it is for a period introducing a structured process in which we challenge and support each other to listen to God, to respond to his promptings, to make that call and to build relationship. And then to use that relationship when the time comes 
to put invitations. So I think it, it is a very novel and helpful piece of thinking, Michael, and you've been very generous in giving your time today and also offering to work with individual churches in that way. So um, I can ask us to put our hands together um, in a moment, if that's the form here on these webinars. And a reminder that if you'd like to contact Michael, michael at weekendofinvitation.com. Uh, and he is at your service. Michael, God bless everything that you do, uh, both with this, your ministry in schools, your God and Science initiatives, uh, all the other things you're doing to help churches to grow at this difficult time. God bless in your endeavours and thank you so much for your time today.